Now, welcome to the Backyard Professor Chess Videos. I've got a game that I played just recently on the Dutch defense that I want to show you that I think is extremely fun for me. It was, it was very fun for me. If the queen pawn opens, you have an option to do a Dutch defense, which I did. I pulled out my f5. And my opponent immediately brought out the bishop. Now, in the Dutch... Uh, based on the reading I've done, this is not the best way to play as white. As a general consideration in chess, as a general rule anyway, it's probably best if you bring out your knights before your bishops. My opponent brings out his bishops first. I went ahead and pushed my d-pawn, giving myself a chance to set up a stone wall. And my opponent is trying to take care of his central pawn by pushing his e-pawn. And of course the famous telltale knight coming out in the stone wall. And now my opponent brings out the bishop again, going check, which virtually forces me, beautifully so, into a stone wall. And uh, of course this limits his use of the bishop, so he pulls his bishop back to where it should have been anyway. So I, I virtually have a stone wall set up, and I go ahead and complete that because you want to push the pawn because this does connect these two, the F and the D pawn, in a really solid, closed center. And now from here, for all intents and purposes, once you set up a stone wall and close the center, you want to aim at this e4 square for you, recognizing that your opponent is going to aim for that hole at e5. And I had a commenter say, well, one of the defects of the Dutch is that hole on e5. Make no mistake about it, that's a difficult situation. Many grandmasters, masters, etc., have said, though, once they get used to the Dutch and the Stonewall, they can work around this hole and uh, I found that I didn't have to work around it because my opponent worked into it. <laughs> he brings his bishop back. And I didn't fear this bishop move, but I didn't want him to take my knight. And as a general rule, basically, someone's not going to take my knight if I went ahead and decided to push my bishop. That probably would have been fine. I chickened out and went ahead and moved my knight because this gives me an option of bringing this knight out up to here and then bringing this knight immediately afterward so that I can perform a king side if I wish. I also have the flexibility, remember, of jumping immediately over to the queen side because for all intents and purposes, this center is now closed and so it's obvious that eventually, soon, we're going to start doing wing play because there's no place to go in the center. And it's at this point that I chose to castle, which is always a safe thing to do, and my opponent castles. Now, we're both pretty decently developed. Nothing's really spectacular going on yet. Here is where, in the stone wall, you make the simple queen move to the E to the e8. Sooner or later, this move really does help you. I don't know what it is about the Dutch that causes it to help you, but this is an important move. One thing, it does give you a chance to come out to the king's side. <clears throat> My opponent beat me to the punch of jumping into the center on that beautiful knight outpost. Now, of course, the knight isn't technically safe there. He is in the hole, so I can't drive him out with a pawn, but I can exchange him with a power, either a bishop or a knight. If I so choose, I can swap him if I have to. I had just played through, at this point, I had just played through, before I played my game, the famous Alekin uh, Bagaljabov 1931 game, which Alekin called one of his very best games where he played a Dutch defense against Bagaljabov at Hastings. This is when Alekhine was at his peak power. Interestingly enough, in a similar setup, Alekhine pushed his A-pawn. He began to thrust on the queen's side. Now, when I saw my opponent 
push his knight, I thought, all right, now, I'm not giving up the center, and I am going to contest it, but I'm going to go ahead and start my queenside push. I'm imitating Alakin. Anytime you can Ill imitate Alakin, you're doing okay, I think. Although none of us can play like him. Don't kid yourself. Well, my opponent pushed the simple pawn to a3, and then I chose to exchange the knight. I thought, you know, it's time to exchange the knights. I can live with this. Now, rather than take me with his bishop, my opponent took me with the pawn. And this is probably the best because, of course, what he's doing is he's opening up a file. My center had been, for all intents and purposes, closed, and his pawns were being blocked. So, exchanging with the pawn was a good thing. I went ahead and took this moment, since he is threatening my knight, to drop my knight to that famous e4 square. Now, I have a beautiful knight on a very fabulous outpost. I'm quite happy with this. My opponent recognizes that knight cannot stay there. It's best to swap it off. So he swaps off the knight. And now we're essentially knightless. It's going to be a bishop's game. I believe at this point I have a much stronger pawn chain that I'm driving back his bishop. And I believe I have much better space. Now, Jeremy Silman says one of the major imbalances is space. I believe my pawns show me I have central space. And also, they are pointing toward the king side. So, in essence, I'm kind of fluid here. I'm flexible. I have a wonderful opportunity to remain flexible. I bring out my bishop. I can play either direction. King side or queen side at this point. Granted, I know, this bishop is a horribly bad caged-in bishop. This is the downside of the uh, stone wall in the Dutch. The white bishop, the queen bishop, is difficult to get active. I lucked out. I shouldn't say lucked out. I got my bishop active. These two bishops are extremely powerful. A bishop's a long-range piece, as you know. They cover two great big swaths to the wings. You can see the center is still closed. There's not going to be a lot of action in this center at this point. Well, he brings up his other bishop. Now, when you look at this, his two bishops are really quite strong also. This is a pretty good placement for his bishops. And I'm thinking, okay, he had to take the time to move his bishops. I'm going to take the time to increase my space on the queen side. I have great space in the middle. Jeremy Silman says, go for it all. Why not get more space on the queen side as well? I'm trying to follow as much of Jeremy Silman as I can. Well, he comes right up the gut with the queen, of course. One, it centralizes the queen. It's keeping my pawn in check so I don't do a pawn roller. As it works out, however, I end up getting a pawn roller anyway. At this point, it's very interesting to see an option. My two bishops here have two really powerful swaths on the, on the board. I can make his bishops completely ineffective. I understand I'm going to open up the king side here, but by pressing his bishop, I bring his bishop down to here, which limits its range toward my king side. And now, because I have my queen on the E, remember I made that simple little queen move to E8 earlier. Because of that, I'm covering my h5 square here, and I'm confident that I can push his bishop back, and he's not going to come and get me. He drops his bishop way back here, and now can you see my next move? This is true. I have opened up my king dramatically, but nobody's going to get through here to me. The king is not hazardously in the open if the opponent can't get to him. This center 
is locked closed. You see that? My two bishops are covering my center. It's solid. It's stonewall solid. That's rock solid. He's not going to be able to sneak his queen in there or check me from a long distance with his bishops. I'm going to destroy his influence of his bishops right here because I, for all intents and purposes, have got his bishop. So he pulls his other bishop up here trying to get influence. And I've got his dark squared bishop. Oh, I'm sorry. I had pushed my pawn to h4, threatening his bishop. And there was nothing he could do. He had blocked himself in. So he brought up his, his light squared bishop. And then I was able to eliminate his bishop. And I was happy about this because, for better or for worse, I am taking... Uh, I'm making some damage. I'm creating a few weaknesses on his king side. You see that? Nothing drastic and major, but I've damaged the king side. The potential, I've just gained a power for free. The potential influence of this bishop is minimal because he's not coming into here. I've got that base covered thoroughly here. And he's on that side. So he's not going to be very influential. Well, my other bishops, Swath is on the queen side, and I have more queen side space, so why not continue pursuing my queen side space and drive his queen back? You see that? I was figuring, you know, I may as well just keep right on trucking. And sure enough, it worked. He drops his queen back. Now you can see... I'm two entire rows forward with four gigantic pawns in a pawn wall, and now I can march. And it's very beautiful. Before you march, now, see, again, Silman, when you get a large center of pawns, like I've got, you have to defend it. <laughs> if you don't, it can be picked away, nibbled at, or completely massacred and destroyed. So give your pawns support. Don't just let them do the work themselves. There's no reason here. I'm not going to bring my queen out to here. There's no point in coming up on this side, on the king side at this point. Uh, the king's pretty safe. The king side's not the place to play. But the queen side is, because now... I have some huge territorial gains here. Support my pawns with backing them up with my queen, is what I was thinking. My opponent brings his queen up. I go ahead and press the pawn to my advantage to threaten his queen again. Now, it's true. He does have the A pawn to be able to take it on the B4. And rather than open up the rook file, my thinking was, I, I know it's going to split up my pawns, but I've got this backed up with a rook and a, bish, a, a queen, and this gives me an open file for my other rook if I so choose to use it. I'm trying to think target conscious at this point. He again centralizes his queen, a very good practice. Again, you can see my center is still solidly locked. This is a rock of granite. He's not going to penetrate through here to get to my king. His pawn is acting as a traitor, as Silman would say, because it's stopping him from getting to me. Isn't that interesting? I hate it when someone makes my pawn a traitor. Now I bring my rook over. I have an open file. I have a target here. This pawn is completely unprotected. Look for targets. You'll notice his bishop is somewhat loose. He has no protection. He's been trying to protect this central pawn. He really has nothing going for him at this time. And I have a lot of power coming through this queen side now. See how that works? He brought his rook to here. And for the life of me, I don't know why he did that. That, in my opinion, was a bad move. He should have put it on C1. Because this is my target. I have a target, and he let me have the target. 
So I took the target. You have to have faith in your targets when you see them. If you can't see any targets, the idea is to try to make targets. And of course, he's going to challenge my open file with his rook. He's got his rook covered here, which is very good. And I'm thinking, if I take his rook, he'll take my rook, and he has the open file. And I don't want him to have an open file. So this is what you have to calculate ahead of time. How do I keep the open file for my use? Because the open file is the lane into your opponent's territory, either direction. Now, he has a lane into my territory. I've kept him out here and over here on this side, away from my king. This file could change that. So, I've got pawns in an excellent space advantage, an imbalance that I am utilizing to seriously good effect. Why not support my rook with my pawn? And I've got a great pawn here. So I did, and he takes the rook, of course. The rook was too powerful on the open file. He took the rook, and I gladly took the rook with the pawn, and now I'm threatening his other rook, which virtually forces him in a passive defensive role with his rook. This is the worst way a rook uh, can be used. If you can at all help it, don't put your rook passively in front of a pawn like that. Now, I have a beautiful pawn on the 7th rank. There is no point in letting him just take it. This is the focal point. I've made my breakthrough on the queen side. I'm going to keep that pawn. I'm going to do everything I can to add to, to the strength of that pawn because I want to break that little baby in. He presses his B pawn. And I think, you know, I've got a, a rook here that can be a good target. I have a pawn here that is undefended that can be a good target. I have a queen here. Essentially, she's on an outpost, and she is in the center, but it is the queen, and she would be the easiest target to go get. I would be willing to swap anything for, for that piece because he's got three powers, I have four. So I'm in the mood to change, exchange, I should say. I'm willing to swap powers. He's not. Does that make sense? So I'm looking for targets here. I've got a bishop here that's completely undefended. You see, yeah, the king's relatively safe, but he's uncoordinated. So what's my favorite target? What's my best target? Well, why not zip over here and take control of my queening square, threaten his rook, and now I can push my pawn in the queen. Then I can have two queens. That was my thinking here. He pulls his queen back down. He virtually is forced into this, so far as I can tell. I can't see any other way out of this without losing that rook just wholeheartedly. I suppose he could have taken the pawn and taken the loss of the rook. Instead, he chose to bring his queen down. Of course, he loses the rook anyway. If I'm going to swap a rook for a bishop, I'll swap a rook for a bishop. That is a delight for me to do, and of course... He does take the bishop, and now his queen is in a defensive role, which is absolutely outstanding. This is wonderful stuff for me. He's on the defense. I'm working my plan. I have a fabulous pass pawn. Hey, now that his queen is doing defense service, I notice another target. The pawn. So, I have an open file. I have a rook. Go get a pawn. That was my thinking here. Well, he dodges his king up to h2. My figuring is, hot dog, I've got a pawn. I've got another target, and now I have another pawn on the a file that's wide open, a pawn knocking on the door, and I'm backing it with a rook and a queen, and I can bring this bishop into this play if I have to. He pops his king down here. Now, do you see the error he made? in my opinion, and, and in a way, there's virtually not much he can do. When you get in a position where you have a pawn on the seventh rank knocking at the door, and you can get a rook or a bishop or a queen into the eighth rank here, 
that is exactly how you play that because you're covering your rook. You're going to get a queen here. So now his queen is pinned to his king here. Oops, well, he moves his king. And I, I, I know you're going to lose your queen anyway, so he should have took the rook, in my opinion. He really should have took the rook. When you're going to lose your power anyway, take out as much as you can with it. That would be the way I would want to play. I would have taken the rook. He didn't, though. Now he brings his bishop back to here. Now he's only got the one colored bishop, and I am three powers up on him. This game is pretty much essentially over, and hey, I see another target, the bishop. And I want to move my rook. Now he moved his king. I want to move my rook out of the way so I can get a queen. And I understand here I have, I have a couple of options. With my queen, I've got a free target here, a central pawn, which is pretty good, and then I would be completely dominant. I have another option. I can take this bishop. But, uh, you know, it's exciting to have two queens on the board. So I went ahead and promoted the pawn. And I have to turn this pawn upside down because I don't have an extra queen here. So I promoted the pawn to another queen. And, of course, that gave him his bishop. So essentially I let him have his bishop. All right, that's fine. He moved it over to here and I thought, oh, hey, maybe I can get the bishop anyway because now I've got the eighth rank with a rook and a queen. I have an open file here with a queen and a queen. Um, I've got him. And now I get, a, I get to go get his bishop. Well, he moved his king up here, of course, to protect his bishop. And, you know, it's a matter of, uh, what, style? I can take the, the bishop. I can afford to. I've got two queens now. That way he's powerless. I could bring my queen up to here, or I could start bringing my other queen out in the round. I chose to go ahead and take his bishop with my rook. And, of course, he takes my rook with his king. And now I have, yet again, my queen open file behind the scenes to put him in check. He dodges up here in front of my bit of my pawn. And I figure, hey, chess is a team sport, right? So bring my bishop down. I've got him checked here. I own this file with my queen. See how even with queens, open files work well. So with rooks. Well, I've got my queen active. I've got my bishop involved, putting the king in check. True, he gets a pawn. It's not that big a deal in a way. Now he can't run around that pawn and hide. So now I can bring my queen over again on an open rank, and now I've got this file controlled and put him in check, and this game is all but over. He moves his king here. I probably did this the slow way. I was so excited I was just making quick moves. I'm closing him down. I'm, I'm bringing in the mating net. I've got him hooked onto this side. I knew it wasn't a stalemate because he could push this pawn and he could push this pawn. I was hoping he would push this pawn so that I could make a cool looking checkmate, you know, with the with the center that has been the theme of my Dutch defense. It would be fun to checkmate him with that. But he didn't do that. He pushed his pawn here. And I thought, well, what the heck? I could have done that anyway. But I brought my queen down here and went checkmate. This, this is the fun of the Dutch defense. You, you lock the center, and then you find ways to make wing play. If you can play both wings like Alekin used to love to do, that's all the better. I had the advantage in that I got to jump on him on the queen side with my pawn roller going because he was focusing on his bishops. And then I started threatening all of his bishops, and because my center was locked up, he virtually had nowhere to go. So this is the power and wonder and beauty and excitement when things go right on the Dutch defense. Things can go horribly wrong with black in the Dutch defense also. I've, I've got several more games I will illustrate with you of other various people who've played the Dutch showing the power of the black in the Leningrad variation as well as the classical Dutch. And then I've got some beautiful games that I've just found that show how white can manhandle black in the Dutch if white plays things right, so... I hope you enjoyed the video. 
I will see you in the next video. Have a great evening.